Hafere, good afternoon, everyone. This confirmation hearing conducted by the Committee on Economic Development, Agriculture, Maritime Transportation, Power and Energy Utilities and Emergency Response is now called to order at 3.08 p.m. Notice of this hearing was disseminated to all local media outlets via electronic mail on November 5th of 2019 with a second notice provided on November 11th of 2019. Notice of the hearing was also made known on the Guam Legislature's website. The committee will hear testimony on Bill Number 53-35 COR introduced by Senator Sabina Perez, Speaker Tina Rose Munya Barnes, and myself, an act to add a new Section 63101 DD Chapter 63 of Title V and to add a new Section 63116.3 to Chapter 63 of Title V and to amend Section 63129 of Chapter 63 all of Title V Guam Code annotated relative to the prohibition of fishing with the use of a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus or scuba and similar devices in the waters of Guam or any vessel in the waters of Guam. And before I go down the list from the sign-in sheet of those who wish to testify on the bill, I will begin by allowing the primary sponsor of the bill, Senator Perez, to provide her opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Uh, Bill 53-35 will protect Guam's reefs and vulnerable fisheries by ending the harmful practice of scuba fishing in Guam's waters. The measure is authored by myself, Senator Rogel, and Speaker Munya Barnes. The bill is a response to growing environmental and cultural threat. In recent decades, our people have witnessed a staggering drop in fish stocks. In a recent study, 832 coral reefs in 64 lo localities Two stood out for having fish biomass low enough to constitute fisheries collapse. It's Papua New Guinea and Guam. Many in our community, including a number of commercial and sport fishermen, have expressed their concerns to me. They've seen firsthand the impacts of scuba fishing and how they're targeting reef fish at greater depths, at greater efficiency than our traditional fishing methods. In fact, scuba fishing is so effective that it's more akin to harvesting than fishing. This relentless practice prevents struggling fish stocks from regenerating, which are essential to the health of our coral reef ecosystems. Studies show that unrestrained scuba fishing can contribute significantly to fisheries collapse. Two species once prevalent in Guam's waters are particularly vulnerable to scuba fishing, a tuhung, the humphead parrotfish, and tagisin, humphead wrasse and both require the ability to grow large in deep waters before returning and repopulating reefs. However, with the advent of scuba fishing, the largest of these fish are now being targeted in deep waters with startling efficiency. Data compiled by the Guam Department of Agriculture shows that all recorded catches of a tuhung and 85% of recorded tangisin catch were caught by scuba fishing. Not only does the impact of scuba fishing harm the livelihoods of all fishermen, but our tourism economy is suffering as well. Snorkeling and recreational scuba diving are significant industries on our island, and with disappearing fish stocks, our reefs are weakened. We must act now and hope to save our fisheries and reefs from ecological collapse. The bill ends scuba, the use of scuba when capturing live fish. Um, this practice was recently banned in Hawaii after the industry grew large and destructive. It's important we regulate the practice in Guam before it, it too becomes unsustainable and harmful force here. Uh, Bill 53-35 aims to improve safety for all fishermen. Currently, scuba fishing is reducing fishing populations found at shallower depths, forcing all fishermen, including free divers, to go deeper. And this is extremely dangerous for free divers and unsafe for scuba fishermen who will need to chase depleting fish stocks at ever greater depths. The solution cannot simply to, to dive deeper and deeper indefinitely while fish stocks die off. The solution must focus on sustainability, and we need to practice in Afamalik. Our ancestors faced challenges in the past, and they managed fish stocks accordingly. They were wise stewards who preserved the environment and their fishing practices for us. Now it's our turn to come together and take responsibility and preserve our resources and culture way for life for generations to come. I view Bill 53-35 as a continuation of this practice. This is our community coming together to establish shared rules that apply to all of us. 
Scuba fishing is certainly not the only risk we face. Climate change, pollution, erosion, storm runoffs also threaten our waters. We absolutely need to do more. We need better enforcement of existing laws. We need to invest in education. And I thank the new director of the Department of Agriculture for taking great strides on this front. But we nevertheless still need a scuba fishing ban if we, mean, we want meaningful change. The ban proposed by this Bill 53-35 has already been adopted in 63 nations and jurisdictions, including the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. This is a tested and sensible approach, supported by most Pacific Island nations, and we should follow the lead of our sister islands and end this destructive practice that is not cultural, not historical, not safe, and not sustainable. I recognize and respect that some may oppose this measure, and I look forward to hearing all viewpoints today. I believe we can have a fruitful and respectful discussion. While we may disagree on some points, we will share the same goal. We wish to protect our environment while preserving a strong and economically viable fishing culture. This has been the way of our people for centuries, and I trust we can openly discuss the threats posed to our dying fish stocks and make the tough decisions necessary to ensure that we preserve our way of life for future generations. The decision we make now will have far-reaching implications. If we fail to address this, our people will lose a practice that defines us. Future school children will have to go to the Guam Museum to learn about pescadots. But if we take action now, we not only preserve our fishing culture, we can help it thrive again in a sustainable and economically viable way. I only hope it's not too late. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Perez. Now I will call upon the public to provide testimony according to the order that people signed in. And if you've not signed in, please do so with my staff in the corner at the table. All right, the first panel I'd like to call forward is Mr. Ted Nelson, Felix Regis, Celestino Uggen, Colin Dre Borja, Johnny Atulai Taitano, Brent Tibbetts, Matthew Orot, or O R O T. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing anyone's name. Also, before we begin, and, uh, please forgive me, allow me to recognize all of my colleagues who joined us today as well. Uh, beginning with uh, Senator Joe San Augustine, Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, Senator Amanda Shelton, Senator Kelly Marsh Titano, Senator Pito Terlahi, Senator Will Castro, Senator Sabina Perez, uh, Senator Regine Bisco Lee, Senator Tello Taidegui, and Senator Therese Terlahi. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Hello. Uh, good afternoon to all the senators. Um, thank you all for finally, after nine years, nine years later, bringing this issue to light. Uh, today, you will hear the pros and the cons, those who support the ban and those who don't support the ban. Uh, well, anyway, my name is Ted Nelson. I used to be an assistant professor at the University of Guam College of Natural Applied Science. Uh, farmer, unemployed, uh, pescador most of my life. Uh, we've, we've, we went forward with this issue about nine years ago through, <clears throat> at the time I guess it's still the majority Democrat uh, in power. Uh, we worked hard at this. Uh, started off with a group of five fishermen from different sides of the islands. A lot more with more expertise and a lot more than myself. Um, we, we garnered thousands of signatures and we presented at the time to whoever was the chair. At that time, it went in from one senator to the next to the next. And after nine years later, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration. 
and anger on what's, what has been just put aside. Like I said, there'll be pros and cons to this. The only thing I can say is on what I feel, my opinion from my side. Uh, I'm a landowner, oceanfront owner on the east side. I've been fishing the east side, the marble side, Guayi, Guay, Sasadan, Luna, Pagat, Hanum, since the age of 10 years old. I've seen the, the fish stock deplete dramatically in the last 15 years. Not because I'm an expert, because I go out there and I see it. I've seen, at first, it, it doesn't matter who the individuals are, I'm not gonna get on who are doing it and all that, because pretty well you can say uh, this and that, but whoever, to me, I call them the offenders. For the last 12 years, instead of fishing, for steady, you know, even for profit, the greed that I've seen out there, the use of these uh, big Yamaha boats with up to 30 people at a time who spent two to three months on the east side and just go and just rape the outside of that side of the ocean because if you go there now, I'll challenge any of you, if you guys free, free dive, come out there, bring your snorkel, be safe, and you understand what I'm talking about. You know, in the past we had scuba divers, yes, and it was mostly Chamorro men. And I've known all these old men. And they've never, they, fa they fished because they needed to make money and also to sustain their family. But they never went and wiped out for profit and greed. The amount of stores that I've picked up in the last 10 years, fish stores, is a good prime example of this type of abuse that's occurring around the island. The east side of Guam is already like the west side of Guam. And I, I am supportive of this ban. Um, in respect to those who do not support it, they have their opinion. But just because I fished out there all my life, I see it. Fish, growing up and fishing on that side, the fish have a pasadero. Most fishes, the lugwa, the tuhun, the tataga, the hangun, they follow a certain area and stay within certain radius. And I'm, I hope there's a scientist here who can verify that. And at night, they're helpless. And I've seen, seen a lot of damage done. But in fact, that all these things, that all these things, in fact, that all these things, God, if it's all that, then it's just a, it's a do. If there's an ecosystem in every little corner within every mile of this island around the island that these fishes are live and if you wipe out that area there'll be nothing left you know it's been a long hard nine years the first thing I want to say to Senator Clint Rogel is my apologies to you you know um, it's a very sentimental issue to me you know well respect for you my apology to you you know when it came out they were showing the Saipanese guys putting it out that, hey, Atanaste, you know, you making fun, Banadosu is showing off. You know, that hurts. Because I've never went, i fished a lot. I never go out of greed. I guess I'm hoping it, if we wanted to tunk you on the east side, we'll be filthy rich. But you know, that is our domain, the ocean is our domain as a people for future generation. No, no individual or no group of people have to write for profit and greed to go and destroy this sustainability of our of fish stock. And that's where I come from. And you know, that's, it's, it's very important to me. Been nine long years. I was very frustrated in the past. It went through some senators, some of them are not here. But I, I seriously want you to consider putting a ban on the use of scuba. It's banned throughout the whole Pacific region, all Pacific nations. You go to Samoa, you go to Northern Marianas, you go down to New Zealand, you go everywhere, it's banned. And you know, you know what's lucky about this, those people? There's, there's availability of grant funding for conservation to help the local industry build up the fish stock. And that's the advantage of this. You talk about economics, the people who want to do it for profit, oh, but they have to feed their family and everything. It's more than that. 
there's a lot more opportunities that will come in the future if they look for it through grants and everything else. I just want to hey, thank you. My God, there you, a lot of you here. Thank you, Joe, and all of you. Uh, please take this under consideration. Um, and I, I pray that you consider banning the use of uh, artificial uh, lungs, whatever you call it, in the scuba. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Just to clarify, I want to be clear. Are you in favor of banning scuba fishing? Because some people. Yes, are, I am uh, in favor of banning uh, scuba fishing. The reason I want clarification is some people are confused and they think this is to ban scuba diving. Period. I just wanted to be clear on the no, record that, that what you are true. saying. You are in support. The of. use of scuba while you you're diving at night that's a big factor, even during the day. And then if the ngungatsa manum mabaygu or where they kick back or where they go back when they for go fishing, back and forth for fishing, right? Yeah. So you are you day or night? You go into those caves, you will you will wipe them out. So do you have any problem with scuba diving without fishing? There's, but there's nothing wrong with scuba diving. I you just know? wanted I to mean, be clear. You have Thanks. MDA, you have these professionals, master divers that take tourists and everybody out, and they are more more concerned about the fish stock being there because that's part of. You know, why take people to the zoo and there's no animals? You know, I mean, bottom line, I am against it. And, you know, if there's any fines, I feel that the fines should be really hefty, an amount of like $10,000, and all fines and all equipment and everything be given to Aquatic and Wildlife to help them do enforcement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uggen, please introduce yourself for the record before you begin. Thank you. Half a day, Senator. My name is Celestino Uggen. I am the Division Chief of Aquatic and Wildlife Resources. I am here to express my support for Bill 5335, uh, a, basically a, uh, a bill that will ban scuba spear fishing on the, uh, in the island of Guam. Uh, we will be su uh, submitting a written testimony in this regard, and uh, I must apologize, we, we, uh, uh, and that will be submitted afterwards. Uh, basically, to continue as is, is basically conducting unregulated fish harvesting around the island of Guam. So what we are basically looking at would be the spearfishing of fish who are basically uh, sitting ducks if, if uh, spearfishing is occurring at night. And so what we would like to see is that to be uh, implemented as far as this regard. Is this the final answer? Absolutely not. We don't really, we don't believe this will be the final answer as far as uh, the recovery of Guam's fish fishery. Uh, but I, I believe this, this is one of the, uh, this would be basically a, a uh, start in the right direction. And we will be submitting our testimony in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ogun. Mr. Taitsuna? Please introduce yourself before you begin your testimony, for the record. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm glad to see you, Senators, are all convened. Uh, Missed you the other day, half of you at the Veterans Memorial. But this is more important. I can see you understand that. I'm not a public speaker, so I'm not going to dwell on if, ands, and buts. But I love my ocean. I love my island. I love my fishing. Fishing has been good to me. Look around this room right now. I don't think anybody has caught half the fish that I've caught. And I paid a hefty price for it. The government's come down on me like thunder. I've been arrested 38 times, formally and informally. I've had $50,000 worth of gear stolen. I've lost over 100,000 pounds of fish that was confiscated by the government. And what have I gotten for it? Nothing. Like I said, I love my island. And I love seeing the kids coming out trying to learn something about our island. How long have I been fishing? I'll be 75 in two months. I started at seven with my grandfather. 
And in those years, you learn about everything from the moon to the sun, the tide, the weather, the rain, and whether you did something wrong the night before, because you're going to be gratefully rewarded the next day, or you're going to get punished. That's our tradition. That's our culture. I'm not for... I'm not saying that scuba fishing is, is bad. Because I look around, I see a couple of guys that did real well. They got their reward, they got their picture with their big prize fish. But the real problem isn't in this room right now. Our, our fisheries is, the demise of our fisheries is due to other causes. And I see it every day. You want to catch me, gang? Where am I, where am I at, Senator Will, Bill? Down at the boat basin, 5 o'clock, you too, Clinton, you know it. I'm drinking with the boat basin bottom scratchers. We watch the fishermen of Guam. And the real fishermen of Guam, they're not in here. And I'm talking about the Chukis. In the last five years, they've, they've opened up 18 fish stores from Malesso to Anderson. And if I'm wrong, on my chest is where you belong. They brought in over 180 boats, some of them registered, some non-registered. And if this is my real reason to be here, it's the fact that one day minus tomorrow, somebody's going to get in a horrid accident, and I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet. Somebody's going to die because no license, no lights on these vehicles. Half of them don't have life jackets. And because of scuba fishing, three of the young men have died in the last three years, and I know this for a fact. For what type of accident, I don't know. But one is the son of a, one of the fisher, fish market owners. But you want to talk about what does it do to the fish? Let me tell you something. All the fish I've caught, I've had to study. Fish are smarter than, when you're in the water with fish, they're smarter than you in the water. You want a tuhung? I can take you out right now and show you a Conestoga wagon of a tuhungs. They're not dumb. When the, when the divers go out, certain things they get conditioned to, the sound of engines, lights, they're not stupid. Now, what I admire now is the boys are going out and they're catching mahi-mahi with spearfishing. Now, that's a trip. Or a nice big yellowfin. But all the inshore, inshore fishing involved uh, with scuba, that's all baloney. I've been fishing for two life for 68 years and it's all reflective and it's all relative. You want to put a ban on something, put a ban on stupidity. Have the regulators come down there and they, 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 they do their job. But to ban something like scuba fishing, there's no man in the world that's smarter than the big two of them that I know that are hiding out there. And that's all. I'm not going to take any more of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Titanoff. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call up uh, some more members of the public who have signed up to testify, including... I will, I'll call out the names, but if you're not here to testify uh, orally and you're just here for support, you don't have to come up. So, Thomas Flores, Rhoda Basto, Christiana Ebio, Roy Brown, Kathy Brown, Victoria Manley, Nissa Galanto, um, someone with the last name Hamilton, I'm not sure what the first name is, from Underwater World, Sarah, is it Sarah Hamilton?
Someone with the last name Cabral. I apologize, I can't make out the first name. F.M. Cabral the second. Lewis. I apologize, Mr. Cabral. Jacqueline Quintanidza, Mallory Morgan. Uh, Davian Array from Marine Mania. Mercy, I believe, from Marine Mania as well. Roman Equilon. We'll begin with this panel first, beginning um, from the left. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, I was just mentioning I feel kind of weird because so many of you I have history with. And the last time I sat in the legislature was, when was Typhoon Pamela? Yes, around 76. That was the last time, student government day. I was somewhere in the corner, trying to make a speech and not lose it. <laughs> um, I'm here today because one, originally I was trying to make a decision whether I was for or against this bill. And I'm sort of stuck in the middle because of certain reasons and many people kind of know my opinion on this. Uh, some of the opinions were loudly stated. Thank you. Uh, now I found out he's Uncle Johnny Atule. Uh, for his comment on it, I mean, that's something I didn't want to bring up. I try not to bring up in, in that fashion. But before I begin, I'd like to just uh, tell you a kind of a story which relates to this. Uh, the wife and I are having dinner, KFC, or we're at Gun Beach when the right side was still open and it wasn't blocked off. And I'm sitting there watching people going out into the water. And of course, Gun Beach is a popular dive site for night diving as well for scuba divers. But for a little bit there, it didn't look right. First, I thought there were people having problems. And then next thing I know, a particular pattern occurs with what I, we call the up and down for free diving or even just you know, spearing or doing whatever, but no scuba. And immediately after that, a boat pulls in and picks something or somebody up. Uh, in the process, I thought maybe I'd call it in. GPD couldn't get a hold of anybody, nothing. We tried, tried for a while, and then I would decided to go down and, because I kind of recognized one of the boats, and just to confirm my suspicions, I went all the way down to Ganya Boat Basin, and lo and behold, the very same boats were pulling in. Um, with that, what brought to me was the problem with the bill was Yes, we talk about the enforcement, but it's also the lack of the funding for the enforcement. I'm, my, my fear is that even though this mandate, if this becomes a law and it goes out, and I have spoken with the aquatics guys on this a lot, the biggest issue is support for them because these guys already have a lot between land poaching, uh, sea turtles, and making sure that someone doesn't start a fire up in the hills so that way they have to wait for somebody to show up and go deer hunting that night. And by the way, I'm, also, I'm a fisherman, both free diving, or used to be. I've scuba speared, but I'm very, very selective. And I was a bow hunter for both pig and deer. I hated shotguns. They were a little too rough on my shoulders. But the important thing was is I was raised to respect what was out there. And to be honest, we have lost control of our waters. We have lost control of being able to say what we can do out there and who goes out there. Um, everything I've asked, questions I've asked, all the answers I got back is that's not available, that's not available. We don't have permits. We don't have the designation between what's commercial and what's recreational as far as fishing is concerned. Doesn't matter whether it's rod and reel on the boats. The only commercial fishing we know are the charters. That's it. Um, part of my, my issue with the bill, 
Uh, one moment, I just lost my thought there. Uh, so, sorry for my health. I've been sick for the last couple of days, so I'm just trying to put it all back together. Actually, I wanted to go back to something because I feel well, after seeing high school kids here in the room as well, I'm a certified scuba diving instructor. I have taken people through all sorts of training. This is as of 20, 2018 was my 20th year as a dive instructor here on Guam. I've worked in Palau. I've worked in Yap. I've dove in other places where they've actually asked me if I could help and work. And, and I've actually seen some of the fishing practices while I'm there. I guess that's the advantage of them finding out you're an islander, come with us, type of thing. And they introduced me to all these other aspects of their fishing. But the important thing is, is and as was, was mentioned earlier, there is a concern on my part. There are people out there fishing who are not certified, who shouldn't even be in the waters. There are people fishing, free diving, who have no idea what they're doing. They're just buying a spear gun out of the store and taking mass snorkel fins and going out. Uh, which, that's what it was. It brought me back. I have, unfortunately, in my 20 years as a dive instructor, I have pulled up two bodies from the water. One, a free diver, snorkeler, who died from shallow water blackout, and a scuba diver, who basically died of a heart attack. I do not have a distinction between the two because of that. I do not see the distinction between scuba and free diving in regards to this bill. The other concern I had with the bill was in reading it, any other devices using scuba, that unless, my understanding is I'm waiting to hear how they're gonna go about this, but how about for people like Marine Lab, Underwater World, uh, people who make a living off of collecting exotic fish for aquariums, um, things like that. How will we deal with that in this bill? How will that be dealt with? And the biggest thing for me is, again, going back to the education for this. I mean, matter of fact, I just had an interview of Arlene Steffi regarding the village of Assen and how growing up there, we were taught that when you went out into that water, you respected everything that you did out there. Um, I kind of look towards Senator Shelton, and I'm proud to say that name for the second time, you know, after so many years, that she would know that behind their place, unfortunately, I mean, Mr. Nelson <clears throat> talks about the east side being depleted. My favorite dive spot, spot is Assen Cut. I grew up in that watering hole. I played in there, I fished in there, among other things. Now I go there, if I'm lucky to find one octopus or a fish bigger than my, the, past my wrist, I'm lucky. I go out there now and there are days when that place is desolated. I have seen firsthand what happens under there. Well, they'll just go right by me without a care in the world and completely wiping it out, and we know exactly whose boats and where they're from. If we're going to ban spearfishing on scuba or anything, why don't we go a step further, ban scuba, I mean spearfishing at night altogether. That's where, according to Senator Paris, the fish are at their weakest. That's when they're at their most inactive. That's when they're most vulnerable. So if we're going to do that and take a first step, because now we need to worry how many more guys, conservation, how many more conservation officers are you going to need? After doing Palau for a job I did there many years ago, I'm sitting there with 124 Karor Rangers, and then I'm looking at only one, two, six, five or six here on Guam to cover the entire island. That doesn't make sense to me when we only have that, and I remember there used to be a lot more. Uh, and then, of course, it comes down to how are we going to know? So even if we ban it, and uh, of course, I'm glad for you know, Johnny bringing up the fact that you got guys that are out there free diving at the fads, collecting big fish. But if they have to have a scuba tank on the boat, what happens when they come in and they inspect the boat and they see spear holes on it? and they see a scuba tank off on the side, but that scuba tank's only there for emergency purposes. Are they going to be held liable for just having that tank on the boat? There are questions, and I only ask this question because I also follow with 
the state of Hawaii in regards to competitive spearfishing. And in most cases, the last time I looked at a flyer from Hawaii for a tournament, an entire page of those who have passed from free diving, an entire page. I'm sure it's bigger than that right now. We have our own cases. I, even though it wasn't supposed to happen, I found the ashes of one of our Asin boys out there because his family wanted to put him where he belonged because he died free diving, spear fishing out in our waters. So there are da inherent dangers in both. Now, like I said, if we're going to do it, I would go for, I mean, ban spear fishing altogether at night. I mean, that would be a good start. Otherwise, I could see permits, fees, anything, seasons. I mean, after spending uh, almost three, three weeks to a month in Palau, I had a chance to talk to them about all those things. And I see how it works. Even in the Philippines, I've seen the process work. And of course, uh, someone mentioned, uh, you know, policing the industry. There is no paddy police, as we call it but there's a possibility of an organization who can control what's going on out there. I mean, that's, that's out there in the open for now. But again, uh, I am neither for or against it. I'm just concerned on how well the language will reflect on what really needs to be done and the support that is gonna be needed for the gentlemen that were in Mangila that have to cover an entire island, both land and sea. And now my understanding, of course, in the the air when we talk about birds, fruit bats, and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabral. Sir, if you could begin, uh, please turn on your microphone and begin uh, by introducing yourself first. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senators, and everyone here that's present now. Uh, my name is uh, Roman Etkilani. Um, I'd like to start by uh, describing my experience uh, through a chronological order. I started spearfishing since 77 all the way to about 83 uh, as a free diver. Uh, but I got into scuba in 1980, 79, 80. Um, I've been, you know, I've been taught from my older, my seniors, that uh, we, we do not deplete the stock by, you know, we don't finish the parrotfish or the tataga or whatever species by wiping them all out in one area. What we did was we select, we were very selective we would hunt uh, fish, uh, only those that are like mostly males, a certain size. We didn't, we didn't go after everything. We didn't do indiscriminate uh, spearfishing. And we'd leave that area after a while for the longest time. And then we'd come back and it'd be the same. There'd be, it, the stock would be replenished. We kept doing this for years and years. I, I learned this and I've seen it happen time and time again. It was a successful plan. We weren't wiping out the fish. We would take what we can, what we needed, and that was it. We leave the rest alone. <clears throat> now, you talk about the depletion of fishing. Um, in 2006, late 2006, I had to leave spearfishing alone. Uh, also in, in 87 to 90, because I had to go active duty and join the arm, army. But uh, 2006 to, for about nine, nine and a half years, I worked for SRF. And... Uh, Fishing was still okay. A lot of my favorite spots still had a lot of the fish that I liked. But when I came back to it uh, late, I, early 2016, I came back to it. I was surprised to see how, uh, how little and how few. And, and the ones fews that I, the few fish that I saw were usually small. Those were up from like 60 feet up to 5, 10 feet. They're, and these are areas that are, uh, you know, like expand, around the areas of Spanish steppes, uh, over by uh, Cabas Island, Cocos Island. Uh, Tataga would uh, replenish themselves uh, fairly quickly, you know, as long as you don't wipe them all out. You, you, you have a lot of little ones, you leave the little ones alone, they grow big. But if uh, these boats that they come out here with eight divers, uh, six divers in a boat, sometimes more, <clears throat> sometimes you see two or three boats out there. I see them, they're, they're raking the reef. That's literally raking the reef. Okay, they're shooting everything. <clears throat> Whether they sell it or not, they'll take it home if it doesn't sell. So, you know, they're not very, they're not really thinking about it. Um, I myself, I have a brother-in-law. He went back to Chuk earlier this year, but he told me what he, he knows the, about his, his countrymen. 
Well, the chukis that are on these Yamaha boats, the skinny little boats, they, um, he said that he knows what they're doing is wrong. He knows they know it's wrong, but he didn't explain to me. Uh, I have my own theories as to why he said that and, and what they're doing, but uh, maybe I could talk to you about that later. Um, it's, it's very... Uh, it's disappointing and frustrating to see this thing happening right now because we're being regulated to death. Already, they've approved, since 2000, they put into effect the, uh, the fish um, the conservation, you know, um, the fish preserves over so many uh, nice areas of the island where we used to go a lot. And uh, I, was, I was all for that. I, you know, I was in favor of that because they say, hey, we need to protect the fish. Certain areas, certain species are not very fast to grow, and the ones that are really big, they need protection too. So I was all for the uh, fish preserves. But uh, you know what? Those same guys, those Micronesian guys on those uh, Yamaha boats and Marine 6, they're, they're running out there, and uh, they're, they're, they don't care about the law. They're going into these preserves. I've, uh, I've seen them many times whether it be Paddy Point area, Petey, Petey Bamo area, uh, Asgado down south. I see them going there a lot. And I heard from some friends of mine that uh, got pulled over because when they came up, they were being pushed real quickly into a, a, a marker a, a margin, a marginal area right where the fish marker was, and they were picked up because uh, they were diving and they just got up there. So they seized their fish, but they didn't catch their fish inside the preserves. And yet they saw another boat that didn't get picked up, but they're so much more elusive because they're very low profile. Uh, those guys got away. When, when, they did, when they did get caught finally, uh, a friend of mine told me they, uh, what they did was let their congressman know or whoever's in charge of insular affairs in Washington. And then Washington calls Guam and tells, uh, tells Guam, hey, you guys got to let those guys' boats go and return all their equipment. You know, that's, that's not right. I mean, why do they have diplomatic community? Why, why, why are they able to fish in the preserves uh, without punishment? And if, if it's uh, one of the local guys, we're there uh, just by suspicion because we, we ended up fishing, finishing our dive right at the, the margin of the preserve. We, we get arrested or, you know, and then we're not sure we're gonna get our gear back. I have a friend, I have a couple of friends like that who fell into that category and they don't know why the other, the, these other fishermen that are from off island, why they don't have the, uh, the laws binding on them? Why is there a two-way standard there? That's one issue I really like to see and find out more about, or what's being done about it. I don't know, we, we, are we turning a blind eye to that? Because, because uh, those uh, outer islanders have much more uh, hold over the U.S. because of the, the tuna fishing grounds? Is that it? Is all politics? That's all? I, I don't find that fair, and you know, fair is fair. Whatever we're gonna have to do, whatever it takes, we have to find fairness and treat all the fishermen alike. I agree, fishing needs to be regulated, and it should start with them, because they're, they're not following the law. I'm sorry, I'm just, I just feel so upset about this. I, I forgot what my other points were. I didn't write it down. <sighs> okay, um, there's only a few people that fall in the same category or very similar to mine. There are still scuba spearfishing today. I only know seven that are actively doing it. And half of those guys only go when the moon is down, you know, when it's not bright. Because when the moon is up, the fish have the advantage. They're a lot more metallic or wild. They're a lot harder to catch. People think that it's just a, like going up to them and putting them in your fish bag, but it's not that easy. If it was so easy, why aren't there more people doing it? No, the, the, those other fishermen that are complaining about us, they do that because they, they do it out of spite and out of uh, jealousy because they can't do what we're doing. I've never been bent. I never had to go to the chamber, but I know I've... I've uh, uh, gone into a light, slight decompression sickness, you know, mild, but not enough to, <clears throat> I'd be over it in, within an hour. 
That's how mild it is. I know what I'm doing. Sometimes we take chances, and that's how we sometimes get hurt. But, you know, we don't have to take chances if we know things are going to be fair. <clears throat> There's only about seven of us right now. A lot of my partners, they were like 10, 15, 20 years older than me. A lot of them have died or have gone the way of the dodo. They're no longer around. They can't do it anymore because they got some kind of sickness. What we do, what we started out with was supporting our families, bringing fish home for special occasions. But then, uh, in my case, I found it uh, beneficial to supplement my income, help put myself through college on UG. That's what I did. You know, you can imagine that. I hope you really give this some serious consideration and think about how, trying to help us because we don't even show any uh, indigenous rights or support of it. I don't see any. I'd like to see some, some kind of action on that because we don't seem to have any indigenous right. All the regulating I see going on right now is against us and it's helping the outsiders. And I don't see why that is. That, that's not fair. Right now, that's all I have to say. Well, I, I'm... A, I, so obviously, I'm uh, against the ban on scuba spear, but I'm greatly in favor of the Fisherman's Co-op, headed by Manny Duenas, and my friend's fish store, a metallic fish store in Agate. You can see what kind of fish we bring in over there. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, if you uh, may begin by introducing yourself first, for the record, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Mercy Gilney. I'm a student at George Washington High School. I'm here today because of my club, the club that I'm in at GW, which is Marine Mania. Lately, when I, when I first joined the club, we started doing a lot of tabling outreach, and we talked about the ban of fishing, the ban of fishing with scuba. And I've heard a lot of pros and cons about it. And I'm not against like anyone's culture or like people's traditions or practices, but I don't believe that uh, fishing with scuba is a tradition or part of our culture because back then we fish spear fishing, free diving. But unlike these other fishermen, I haven't been around very long, to, done a lot of like fishing. But uh, as far as I know, I've done, I've done a presentation at the briefly hours that Noah created at the museum. And when they were giving us the introduction, it talked about how like over the period of time when people kept fishing, uh, the size of the fishes kept getting smaller and smaller. And I, that's a big concern to me because like for my generation and the future generations, I want my kids, my kids' kids to, see, to be able to see parrot fishes, many kinds of um, fishes in our oceans today. Like I want all of us to see it because our island is beautiful. People all around the world come to see it and It'll be really sad if in the future not many of us will be able to see such, like, the beauty of our island. Um, I'm in support of this ban. Like, I'm very firm that this ban will contribute to our island and our practices. Our environment pr plays a big part in our culture, and I believe if we, like, do more sustainable practices, we're also helping our own culture. So, so far, that's all I have to say for today. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am? Good afternoon, senators, and thank you for being here. My name is Sarah Hamilton, and I'm the curator of Underwater World Guam. I would like to speak to you today about adding an amendment to Bill 5335, providing educational, scientific, and research entities the ability to apply for a permit, allowing them to collect animals on scuba for their educational needs. Tumon Aquarium LLC, more commonly known on the island as Underwater World, has had its doors open to the public for over 20 years. We receive over 100,000 visitors a year, both international and local. Underwater World's education mission statement is as follows. Underwater World's education programs are designed to increase public awareness and knowledge of our planet's coral reefs, oceans, and the animals that depend on them. Um, through this, we hope to promote individual responsibility and stewardship and for the continued well-being of our environment. 
Underwater World provides thousands of international and local guests with the opportunity to see some of Guam's most amazing underwater animals up close. By promoting conservation through education via the use of dynamic and attractive exhibits, we rely upon specimen collection using scuba. Many visitors and even some residents of Guam have never had the opportunity to see and experience the ocean life around them. By combining these exhibits with engaging science, signage, we strive to educate all our visitors on why we must protect our ocean resources. Through our education programs, we bring in 20 to 25 local high school interns a year who also get the opportunity to work in the animal care area and learn about the animals and how we care for them. We currently have members on our animal care staff now who were our former interns and fell in love with marine biology and the conservation efforts we strive to provide. Other interns have gone on to attend UOG to study biology with the hopes of becoming future marine biologists. Last year we had 76 field trips and weekends tours and so far this year we have had 88. We were even asked by a Japanese tour agency this year to create a special education program about the importance of protecting sea turtles and coral reefs. We also participate in career days and outreach events around the island every year. As a company, we strive to give back to our local environment. We have partnered with many organizations to help with coral outplanting projects, nursery cleaning, and in the past have even hosted sea core workshops which brought scientists and aquarists from other facilities to Guam during the mass coral spawning events. We work with the Division of Aquatics and Wildlife Resources and WISEL to rehabilitate injured sea turtles when they are found. We also participate annually in the International Coastal Cleanup, not only as sponsors, but also as site leaders. The complete inability to collect animals on scuba would not only severely limit our ability to con continue this practice of promoting conservation of Guam's ocean life through our education programs, but also take away available funds from our areas of conservation and environmental focus. As a conservation-minded company, Underwater World agrees there must be changes made to help preserve our natural resources. As such, we support a ban on scuba spearfishing and collecting for export purposes. However, we ask for an amendment to Bill 5335 allowing for education scientific and research entities to be able to apply for a special permit, allowing them the ability to conduct specimen collection on scuba for their facility's educational needs. The recommendations with this permit would include monthly reporting of all animals collected on scuba, as well as the location and depth of where they were found. We would also not be opposed to the permit including rules for restricted species, sizes, take limits, and or times of year for collection of certain species. Currently, Underwater World strives to use sustainable collection practices. Um, we use scuba to collect animals one to two times a month, depending on weather, boat ability, and staffing. We collect on scuba only during the day at depths between 30 to 40 feet, utilizing small mesh hand nets. On average, we collect between 60 to the max 80 animals per month on scuba. If our exhibits are in good supply, we halt collecting completely. We submit a report to the Division of Aquatics and Wildlife Resources each month listing the species and the amount collected. The animals we collect stay at Underwater World for exhibit and education use only and receive the highest level of animal care from the moment of collections and throughout their lives at Underwater World. We also have a working strict in-house no-take list that currently includes the ornate, oval, and reticulated butterfly fish, titan and yellow margin triggerfish, emperor and regal angelfish, soapfish, goatfish, long-nosed filefish, Napoleon wrasse, any species of parrotfish, large grouper species, eels, seahorses, cornetfish, and trumpetfish. There is a common saying among zoos and aquariums that people won't protect what they don't love, and they cannot love what they do not know. Nothing matches the bond people create with a living creature than seeing them in real life. I see and experience this every day when I walk through the aquarium and hear the excited voices of children watching the animals th swim through the tunnel. And when I see a guest's eyes light up as they discover a fact about an animal they never knew. We acknowledge and agree a scuba fishing ban is necessary to ensure the survival and hopefully the comeback 
of species, including the Napoleon wrasse, bumphead parrotfish, and large grouper species to Guam. However, we humbly ask you consider our request for an amendment, again, allowing for education, scientific, and research entities to apply for a special permit, allowing them to continue their necessary fish collection on scuba. It is our hope that by engaging guests in our exhibits, it will inspire an appreciation for our ocean animals and environment, ultimately encouraging them to support other conservation organizations and further efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Half a day and good, good afternoon. My name is Christiana Ibio, senior of George Washington High School and vice president of Marie Mania. I have created the online petition called Sustain Fish Populations, Ban Fishing with Scuba via change.org. It states, in favor of Bill 5335 to prohibit fishing with the use of scuba and other underwater breathing apparatus, fishing with the use of scuba, especially at night, is contributing to the reduction of fish populations on Guam because many species sleep at night, which make them easy targets. This method of fishing also removes a depth refuge with, uh, which often protects large females. Large females can produce 100 times more eggs than the smaller ones. The Tengisin wrasse, also known as the humphead wrasse, were valuable for dive tourism, which provided a much greater revenue for, to Guam than the commercial fishing industry. However, many fish, including the bumphead parrotfish and humphead wrasse, have declined at an alarming rate and have all but disappeared from Guam's waters, even with the establishment of marine preserves. 63 countries, states, and islands have banned fishing with scuba and other underwater breathing apparatus. All of our neighboring islands have enacted the ban. For example, Saipan, Rota, Tinian, Palau, Yap, Kosrai, Pompeii, and even Chuk. As a result of banning fishing with scuba in American Samoa since 2001, populations of parrotfish have increased and have been recovering. We, the people of Guam, must protect and preserve what we have left of our natural resources. And this is not a restriction of fishing, but a step towards a more sustainable future. We have 1,262 signatures as of 11, 11 p.m. last night. We are not saying that you cannot spearfish. You can, just not with the scuba gear. Think about it. When you're down there, you stay as long as your oxygen tank runs out. You'll kill every fish that you see in sight. I can tell you without a doubt that overfishing can lead to an ecosystem collapse. Climate change and erosion already put enough stress on Guam's coral reef, says Sherry Bush, who has obtained a degree in, environment, in environmental science. We don't need to dive to kill, we need to dive to heal, says Ari Ritten, a citizen who has signed and commented on our petition. Our marine life play a huge role in our history and beauty of the island of Guam. We are known for our waters. Many tourists come to see our coral reefs. Fish keep our reefs healthy and vice versa. With any fish, our reef would die. Guam's tourism economy would be greatly affected. And part of our culture, the Chamorro culture, is to fish using the taladza. Our ancestors didn't use oxygen tanks. People are still able to use the taladza, rod and reel, scoop net, to name a few. There is a reason why the other 63 states, countries, and islands have banned fishing with scuba. For example, take a trip to Palau. Palau has vibrant, healthy corals with abundant fish. In fact, Palauans have some of the highest per capita fish consumption compared to other regions in the Pacific. Yet, they have an abundance of fish. Again, we are not saying to stop spearfishing, but not to spearfish with scuba gear and to help preserve what we have left and to save it for the future generations to enjoy the beautiful waters of Guam. My name is Christiana, and I hope Guam can be the 64th. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'd like to call up the next panel. Maria Keltermark, Jennifer Weir, Chelsea Munya Breck, Leilani Sablon, Nathaniel Martin, Whitney Hoot, Chanel Salazar, Monique G. Amani, Gabriel Jereza, John Pierre Estrelato, Sharon Vexler.
All right, and we will go uh, left to right again. Ma'am, uh, on the far left, please begin by introducing yourself, and then you may begin with your testimony. Thank you. Half a day. My name is Whitney Hoot. As the Coral Reef Resilience Coordinator for the Government of Guam, I would like to present some of what I know about scuba spearfishing and also what some of what I know about the health of Guam's coral reefs. Scuba spearfishing threatens the future of Guam's fisheries and our coral reef ecosystems. A study in 2006 found that a complete ban of scuba spearfishing paired with effective enforcement is the single most important intervention needed to manage fisheries in the Pacific Islands. In 2012, research conducted on the Great Barrier Reef showed that spearfishing significantly reduced the density and average size of the leopard coral grouper over a short five-year period. And this is one of the most notable things about this practice is how quickly it can have very severe impacts. Removal of these large fish from reefs creates a problem for fish reproduction as the large females spawn significantly more eggs, often exponentially more than small fish. Now, large-bodied fishes, including the bumphead parrotfish, Napoleon wrasse, and many groupers are now rare on Guam's reefs. This decline has been attributed to heavy fishing pressure, including scuba spear fishing. The loss of these fish also has impacts, implications for the continued success of tourism on Guam, as willingness to pay studies have found that divers and snorkelers will spend more to visit locations that have more fish and larger fish, especially charismatic species like the bumphead parrotfish. In 2014, a study on Guam and in CNMI, where spear, scuba spear has been banned since 2003, found that this fishing practice decreased the abundance and size of important herbivorous fishes, including parrotfish, surgeonfish, and unicornfish. These herbivores are absolutely vital for coral reef health as they eat the algae that can outcompete corals. Additionally, um, excessive algae impacts coral reproduction because young corals need clean substrate on which to settle and grow. Between 2013 and 2017, Guam lost 34% of all live coral on shallow reef slopes around this island, 60% of live coral on the eastern shallow slopes, and 37% of coral on shallow reef flats. This is a five-year period. This intense and devastating loss is largely attributed to the severe coral bleaching that we had experienced in 2013, 2014, 2016, and 2017. Unfortunately, due to climate change, bleaching events are expected to increase in both frequency and intensity. Guam is predicted to experience annual coral bleaching by the middle of this century, although this may in fact occur much sooner. Healthy populations of herbivorous fish, which are a major target of scuba spear fishing, are vital to the ability of our reefs to recover after bleaching. After corals die, their skeletons are quickly overgrown with algae. Without herbivory, no new corals will be able to restore the habitat needed to support fish populations, which creates a destructive feedback loop. We must ban scuba spear fishing if we want to increase the resilience of our reefs to climate change and ensure their survival into the future. Fishing methods have evolved with time and become highly efficient. The catch per unit effort for scuba spear fishing, which is the amount of fish that are caught per piece of gear per hour, is greater than any other type of fishing used on Guam. This practice is harming our fisheries and those who depend on reefs for sustenance. All others are at a disadvantage compared to scuba spear fishing, especially as this practice is causing such decline of our fish stocks. Scuba spear fishing has been banned in so many countries because people noticed huge declines in fish populations after the introduction of this technique. Furthermore, the destructiveness of scuba spear fishing is compounded when this activity goes on night because fish are sleeping and much more vulnerable to capture. Guam's marine preserves are working by providing young fish to repopulate our reefs. However, not enough of these fish are surviving to reproduce as they are extracted before reaching adulthood. Surveys conducted in 2011 and 2017 
showed that island-wide total fish biomass declined by about 50%, and this is a seven-year period. This number should be a cause for great concern. There is no sign, um, and although our reefs, our reefs do face other pressures, such as pollution, there is no scientific evidence that land-based sources of pollution are the cause for this severe and sudden decline of our fish stocks. We need to better regulate our fisheries and prevent this destructive fishing method from further damaging our reefs and our communities. Without action, future generations will not have the privilege of experiencing the beauty and benefits of Guam's coral reefs. Without action, Guam's reefs will no longer be able to provide the vital services they give to the people of Guam and visitors to our island, fisheries, coastal protection, cultural experiences, and support for tourism. Without action, we are letting our precious, unique, and highly valuable coral reefs slip away. I urge you to support Bill 5335 as it represents a crucial step toward the better protection of Guam's coral reef resources. Our island depends on our reefs, and they are depending on us. Thank you. Thank you. Hafiday Senator Rajel and committee members. Um, my name is Chelsea Munyabrecht. I'm the director of the Department of Agriculture. I assume most of you are in possession of our testimony. Um, what I would like to do is kind of deviate from that a little because like, a whole page of that is just facts. Um, and for expediency's sake, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity. Um, what I would like to do is just go over my recommendations with you. Um, first, please consider amending subsection 63116.3b to read, um, empowering our co uh, conservation officers to issue citations rather than um, violations that would have to be um, pursued by the Attorney General's office. Uh, that is simply because the process of adjudication through the court becomes time consuming and cumbersome for our conservation officers, the department, and all those involved with enforcing the laws. Um, we are of the mind that issuing citations which would be more beneficial to the department and in lieu of arrestees being able to pay the fines for the citations, then we would gladly take it in um, community service to the department. Um, and also amend board any vessel or inspect any vehicle so that they can also inspect cars versus boats. Um, and add a provision for harvesting uh, with, uh, with permits from issued by the department for educational and research pur purposes. We do that already for the marine preserves. Um, additionally, add subsection 63116 um, to make it illegal to purchase caught fish or harvested fish using scuba or other underwater breathing devices. Number three, amend the legislation to include a moratorium on nighttime spearfishing with or without scuba or other underwater breathing devices. Um, I have personally brought up this issue on numerous occasions with other local fishers in meetings and community outreach, and each time the groups have been in favor of this. They see the impact of overfish that overfishing is having on our fish biomass, and they too want our ecosystem to heal. Additionally, it's easier for the conservation officers to enforce a moratorium or a ban on nighttime spearfishing if there should be no lights in Guam's water at night versus having to check on each light to ensure that they're following the law or not. Number four, work with our department to immediately introduce legislation to make commercial vendor reporting mandatory with stiff penalties for withholding information or reporting false information. The mandatory reporting will strengthen our ability to enforce this law, current laws, and laws that we are seeking to amend. In additionally, introduce legislation for permitted fishing with catch and size limits that we are working on drafting right now. Um, number five, I've had meaningful conversations um, or meaningful conversation with Mr. Manny Duenas about this very issue and we discussed the option of limited er entry permits, meaning that the department would issue a limited number of permits to individuals who are in compliance with specified requirements. Um, think individuals who are actually certified to be scuba diving versus those who are not. 
Um, we are willing to explore this option further with your offices um, and discuss options that may be workable for our community. But what is needed most of all, for this legislation to work, the Department of Agriculture needs more conservation officers. The department currently has seven COs patrolling island-wide in day shifts and night shifts, five marine preserves, and as dry season comes upon us, fire-prone savanna in southern Guam. Tr they try to work in two shifts, but this is difficult. And Senator, Senator St. Augustine has recently introduced legislation to give us funding for four more conservation officers. Our 2020 budget affords us the opportunity to hire an additional two. The addition of this six, should the new bill pass into law, will alleviate much of the stress and overuse our officers go through each day. However, it is still not enough. To function with full efficacy, we need a minimum of 30 officers. At this point, we will gladly settle for 20. 20 officers to run three shifts daily patrolling northern, central, and southern waters of Guam. As Ms. Hoot mentioned, our MPAs were designed to be the replenishing source for Guam's reef fish. Analysis of data collected in the preserve demonstrates that the stocks were recovering. The fish stocks were beginning to recover. However, illegal fishing activities, poaching in the preserves have rendered the populations critical. As with Bill 53-35, the success of our preserves and the success of this ban will completely be determined by our ability to enforce. We implore you, we need more conservation officers to protect our natural resources. We also need this bill in some form or fashion to pass into law. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senators. My name is Chanel Salazar, and I have decided to speak today because it directly affects me and as well as all the other fishermen and fisherwomen. I myself am a hunter and a fisherwoman, so me going out there past the reef and seeing what is happening, the fish depletion, it really concerns me. And it concerns me because I have fished in other waters on our brothers and sister islands, and you could really tell the difference. Palau, there's so much fish around everywhere, mostly because they have a down pack regulation of their uh, fisheries. Um, Saipan, Rhoda, I mean, me as being a female free diver, it, it's alarming to me because I think if this is how it looks now, imagine what it will be when I have children that I would wanna pass uh, the culture to. And um, like you were saying, it has a lot to do with conservation and um, making sure that there are regulations that will help heal our waters because it is a problem. I would be camping in the west or the east side of the island and I would see those Yamaha boats with their lights going to where I know that is absolutely preserved. And so it, like I said, it, it alarms me and I, I hope that measures will be taken to really improve our island because at the rate we're going, there will be no fish for my children and the children to come. And I say this as a fisherwoman who actually goes out there and sees the, the, the condition of our, not only our reefs, but the fish itself. I don't dive deep, I don't scuba tank, but even the depths that I am able to reach, it's concerning because all the fish that I used to see growing up, diving outside of the reef, you know, we had to learn. I started off fishing with uh, the net, you know, pushing for a two line, and you eventually graduate and try the Tekken, and then as I got older, I decided, okay, let's go outside of the reef, and um, the knowledge of my ninos and uncles were passed down to me, and I would hear them, and they would always talk about how there's just no more fish anymore. It's hard. It's very hard. And it's... Um, it, it is alarming to me, and I hope that the legislation and the government really sees to help fix these problems of conservation officers watching over. Um, I know we have, what is it, five or six out there patrolling our, the bodies of water. Um, 
the funding to make sure that these regulations are intact is very important. Uh, we can't enforce we can't enforce what we cannot even fulfill, which is our conservation officers. So um, it's my deepest hope that we do find um, the necessary um, steps to help rejuvenate our reef most of all and then help sustain it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, Senators. I'm Jean-Pierre Estrellado. I am the owner of Pacific Arc Aquatics. Um, and I'm general uh, operations manager for the Golden Fish Pet Store in Barragata. I am also a fisherman. Um, I was thinking earlier today because some people were um, not necessarily opposed or for the bill. And I'm kind of floating in between that as well because, I mean, I'm, I spearfish myself, but I'm out there for, to feed myself, to feed my family. I, I catch what I need, two pieces, three pieces max. But, you know, it seems like the concern here is people going out there for commercial purposes and raping the reef. And I see it myself. We can all, you know, it's popular today. We're talking about these chukis fishing boats. And um, I know that's the problem. But the reason why I'm really here today is because this bill, the way it's written, the language that is in the text there, it's going to affect my operations and my business. So if um, I can elaborate a little more on what my company does is we export live aquarium fish to wherever United is willing to export it to for us. Um, we supply um, pet stores, we, we supply to wholesale companies that uh, supply um, public aquariums, uh, research institutions, um, there's, there's a lot of different um, institutions that our fish go to, uh, propagation farms, so there's a big movement now and you know it's really popular, save the world, save the planet, uh, conservation, and so a lot of these aquarium fish that are being caught in the wild are actually being bred in captivity now. And we cannot first get those specimens until somebody catches it. So there's a lot of people who are also against export, but you know, just like somebody was mentioning the other day, in the av aviculture, um, if some people weren't breeding certain species of birds, those birds would have been extinct. So you know, just like, like our cocoa birds, we had to first go and collect everything first before you know, we could start that breeding program. Now there's absolutely nothing in the wild. And that's where I see this industry is going to, you know, with global warming, climate change. I see all the cor corals bleaching. A lot of corals are, are damaged. You know, you can, if you destroy habitat, then you lose the fish. So I don't necessarily believe that taking all the fish is going to affect, you know, the populations because the way I see that fish breed it's, they go into a pelagic larval state. I mean, even if we wipe out all the fish here, they're gonna wharf over from Saipan, they're gonna wharf over from Palau. I mean, there's so many points that I can make, but I mean, I'm gonna sit here all day and I, you know, I have so many things I wanna bring up. But, um, so the way the bill is written is that you cannot collect fish using uh, scuba diving or equivalent while collecting aquatic animals. And so me, even though the bill is for spear fishing, um, I don't do any of that, but it still kind of classifies and I don't know, you know, exactly if you guys are trying to attack that industry itself, but that is my livelihood. Um, I was trained by Underwater World. Um, I used to work for them. I used to collect for the, the aquariums there. I was an aquarist and um, uh, animal nutrition specialist back in 2002. So, you know, um, I'm very educated as far as conservation in that perspective. I don't catch more than I need. I feel like there's a substantial amount of fish that's available in the ocean. I'm not, seems like everybody's concerned about the food fish and that's not what we're collecting. We're collecting fish that people don't eat, people don't know about, fish that people don't even see. Um, we're investing into deep water exploration to look for species that have not been found before since we're right here on the Marianas Trench. There's highly high probability that we're going to come across some new specimens, but if you put a ban on being able to collect with those, with, with scuba diving rebreathers, it's going to hinder those kind of activities, those, those new discoveries that we could possibly make. Um, what else is another thing? But, you know, I feel like with this, with this bill, it's not going to solve the problem because it's not just, you know, these, these chukis boats that we're talking about, they're not all fishing with scuba. You know, I, when I'm out there, I don't even see any scuba tanks on their boats. Um, so you're basically just going to create a ban that's not going to affect 
the overall problem. I can still go out there at night with my Hawaiian sling and catch fish, and I, that's what they're doing, and they're wiping it. They're, they're very efficient at it. So scuba or free diving, it doesn't matter. I think if the issue is trying to preserve the, the fish stocks, I think you should just put limits on catches. I mean, there's, I know it's going to take a long time and there's going to be so much um, wording to, to put out a bill that's going to properly cover everything without affecting a certain industries. But, um, you know, I think we should look at the main issues here. So it's, those, it's those fishing boats. It's the fishing at night. It's collecting for uh, or catching fish for commercial purposes. I think if, you know, I want to go out there, I don't want to go to Payless and, and spend, you know, $18 a pound for, for parrot fish. You know, unfortunately, I was too ambitious to um, not be able to qualify for food stamps. So I don't have, I have to actually work hard and go buy fish at Payless. That doesn't make any sense. I like to go catch my own. And I'm not being greedy out there. I'm not catching, I'm not stocking my fridge or selling it, you know. So, you know, that's something you need to look and take into consideration that there are people that are just trying to feed themselves, feed their families. And I'm one of those, you know, and it is easier for me. I don't want to go hold my breath and get a, whole, a headache. You know, I have to swim down to 70 feet to go shoot something decent enough to eat. Um, but, you know, that's something that they really should consider. Um, I'm, I am against people going out, collecting or, you know, spear fishing at night with scuba, wiping out the reefs for the fish shop, selling it, you know, making a profit on that. You know, um, especially catching all the large fish. I don't catch any large fish. I catch all juvenile fish, fish that people are not going to eat, fish that are profoundly abundant. I don't break coral. I'm very, I understand that the habitat is where the fish live, and if I destroy that, then there won't be any fish, and then I will have no business. So I think it's all about responsibility, and, you know, everyone's talking about education. I think we need to invest more into education. Um, you know, a lot of the people that signed this petition that they put out, they don't even realize that they're affecting other industries that have nothing to do with the main concern of this, why this bill was written. Um, you know, it's going to affect a lot of things that they don't even think about. I have friends and, and people that I bring business to from my business that have signed this petition not even realizing because they don't understand the words and text that they are putting me out of business when I am their ally, when I am a business associate, when I am their customer, because they don't properly understand this bill. So I think another thing in, you should put out, a, you know, um, I guess something to help guide people about the bill, what it exactly it entails, how it affects everybody. Um, because, you know, a lot of people are just, you know, with a popular ideology of save the planet, conservation, you kind of just winning that popular vote of banning it all together when people don't really understand what they're signing. And um, I mean, like I said, I can go on and on. I could put out so many points here, but I just want to say uh, lastly that this is my livelihood. Um, you know, there's people in this room that have, that have led me up to this point. You know, I've worked with Department of Agriculture for many years. I am the um, what a veteran uh, kids fishing derby uh, champion, you know, and so that department itself has promoted to me as a child to use fishing, you know, for my livelihood. They promote that so young people would be able to learn to catch fish and use our natural resources and forage for our own food. And we have Miss Linda Tatro there who got me dive certified when I was in Marine Mania, um, you know, underwater world as well. Um, so, you know, everybody, and that's in this room kind of helped to get me to where I am and it'd be sad if you know everybody's voting against what I do because of something else that has nothing to do with me and affect my livelihood put me on welfare you know I'm willing to work I'm a hard-working person and there's I'm sure there's others like me that are going to be affected by this um, they're probably just not here today I don't feel like the majority of the people in this room represent the fishing community that is going to affect um, and I, I I just hope that everybody would look into it more and gain more understanding and look at different perspectives. Um, like I said, I'm not necessarily for, against spearfishing while on scuba because I, I realize that you know it, it should just be regulated, but there's a lot of little details in there that need to be worked out. And I'm hoping that um, you, know, you senators will get together and you know, take into what, I, what account what I say as well as you know, everyone else's point. But, um, yeah, I, I guess that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thank you, everyone, for your testimony. At this time, I have to beg your indulgence. We have to take a short recess uh, so that we can take care of uh, some issues on the other side of session. Recess from session. Come right back in here and continue the public hearing. So if I can beg your indulgence uh, for the remainder of people who have yet to testify, please hang out so that we can uh, about 10 to 15 minutes so we can resume this public hearing. Thank you. <laughs>